Hi. Hi, thanks for coming to my talk. For those of you who can't read, it's called Smartwatch Lobotomy. Um, taking a cheap smartwatch and making it do what I want. For those know, who don't know who I am, I'm Dale. Uh, I work, my day job is I'm a senior software developer at a company called Structure It. We build software for structured markets and stuff like that. But in all honesty, my hobby is, and in my free time, I take things apart. Occasionally, they go back together, not always. Um, I jokingly refer to myself as a jack of all trades, serial skill collector, and you'll see what I mean in a sec, and a high functioning hoarder. I'm not sure about the high functioning part, but I'm definitely a hoarder. So this is the goal when I started all this. It was um, grab a watch and get it running my code. That was how this started. Things never go according to plan. So it's now become make the cheap watch do what I want by any means necessary. I mean, how hard can it be? This started about four months ago, <laughs> maybe longer. And you'll see. So this is the cheap watch. It's called a Focus Fit Pro Y68. It's also called the Smartwatch Y68. It's also called the Smart Fitness Tracker Y68. You'll notice a pattern. The D20 Y68 Smartwatch, the Y68 Macaron Color Smartwatch, the Y68 Smartwatch, and then my personal favorite, the Yeet 68 smartwatch. And trust me, after four months, that's what I wanted to do with them. Um, the watch cost between 100 and 200 Rand, or about two to four McDonald's Big Mac burgers, for those of you who don't speak Rands. Um, they're av available locally on Take A Lot. These all appear to be the same watch. I haven't bought all of them, <laughs> it gets expensive. At the moment, or at least during Black Friday, they started off at 159 Rand a watch. You'll notice a pattern here, they go 199, 299. Then it goes 350, 599, and 699. You can't see it scratched out, it says 999 Rand. Obviously, it's take a lot. They probably always cost 699 or 650 the week before they went on special. But this is as far as I can tell, the same watch. You can also buy it on AliExpress and places like that for somewhere between about three and six dollars. If you buy enough of them, you can get the price down to about two dollars. Um, I can't convince my wife to let me buy 2,000 smartwatches. I'm also not sure what I'm going to do with all of them. Um, always remember when doing this thing, two is one and one is none. Um, whoa. That was fun. Okay, let's get back there quick. So uh, <clears throat> buy six, uh, don't tell my wife. Don't worry, they weren't that expensive, honey. So what happens is the first one I bought was about 199 Rand. The second one worked out about 150 Rand from Take A Lot. Then one day only had this deal where you could get two for 150 Rand. And then they had another deal a little while later where you could get two for 200 Rand. Um, I kept buying them. It was a good idea. Uh, no plan ever survives first contact with the enemy or cheap electronics. I killed three of them so far. There's probably going to be more, um, but it's the price you pay for a good B-Science talk. This is the claimed specs. Um, you'll see what I mean. So uh, it's a 1.3 inch IPS screen. It's a little LCD screen. They claim it's IP67 waterproof. The chipset is this H whatever S. Battery capacity is 150 milliamp hours. They claim it's got a heart rate detection. It's standby is 10 days and takes two hours to charge. Playing around, that's the actual specs. Yes, it does have a screen. Honestly, I wouldn't wash my I wouldn't even wash my hands with wearing one of these watches. I'm not sure I'd take it close to the bathroom. I wouldn't drink a cup of coffee wearing one of these watches. They are not waterproof. They are not anything. It's a couple of bits of plastic clipped together. If you go and read on Take A Lot, you'll notice that some of the specs for this watch include a aluminium anodized housing. No, there's no metal which ever came near this watch. 
Um, the chipset is actually a TLS R8323, which was a surprise when I bought the watch thinking it had the other chipset because that one is partially easily hackable. This one, not so much. The battery capacity varies. I've had these watches open. The printing on the actual battery varies between different watches that claim to be the same model. I don't know. So um, one of the brands was N-Tech, N-E-Tech, something like that. And the one watch had a 100 milliamp hour battery. The other one had 150 milliamp hour battery. That's from the same thing, same box, everything else. Heart rate. Just remember the little X. We'll come to that. Uh, standby time it varies. Uh, if you happen to have paired it with a cell phone, then the the standby time drops dr drastically. It also it depends if you happen to be wearing the watch. The it also varies a lot. If you put it into your drawer and don't touch it or leave it on a desk, you might get three hours. Again, it depends on which one of the watch. I have six of them. One of them makes four days, one of them barely lasts 30 minutes. The charging time, I think they're correct. I haven't timed it, but it seems to be about two hours. I don't trust these things. I'm not gonna leave it on charge overnight. Um, so it's available in many colors. I don't have the pink one. That one sold out incredibly quickly. That's also because the pink one is 20 Rand cheaper than the other watches. The most expensive model is the middle one, which they claim is white. What it actually is, is black plastic, spray painted silver, and comes with a white watch band. Um, <clears throat> charging on this thing is interesting. You pull off the, 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 the watch band, actually clips onto the watch, so you yank it off, and then it exposes that thing. That connector, you shove into a USB socket. <clears throat> now, you know, you always get USB the wrong way around the first you know it takes three tries to get it the right way around this one's even worse because you can put it in the right wrong way around and your watch just won't pay, it won't start charging if it's completely flat you won't know it's not charging because it doesn't do anything until about half an hour into the charging process um you can only charge it if you have an extension because it won't fit inside of most laptops and computers because it can't go far enough into the usb slot to make decent contact and even once you do get it in, some of the watches are slightly slimmer, which means that they don't make proper contact. And when you bump them, they stop charging. Like I say, I want to throw it out the window. The actual hardware. This is just the info screen on the watch itself. There is the model number. You'll see there's no mention of Y68. It's the LT716G. Some of the watches I have don't have the G. I don't know what G stands for. The software version, yeah, the Bluetooth name is LT716. The next string there is part of the MAC address. This becomes really useful when you have a lot of them on your desk and you're not sure which one you're busy poking at. And I have no idea what those numbers mean. One day we'll figure them out. That's the outside of the watch. And um, the on the left-hand side, you'll note that's the front. On the other side is the underside of it. That's got the heart rate sensor. Opening this watch is pretty easy. All you need is a flat spludgy thing and you just pop the plastic cover off. If you want to do it without marking anything, I suggest your prying tool be plastic. Any of those cheap kits you can buy from, you know, take a lot of Weber for 50 bucks. This comes with a little prying tool. Those work great. To be honest, I couldn't care and just grab whatever was on my desk and pried the thing off. There's no gaskets, there's no proper sealing, there's no nothing. And that's why I say if water gets into this, it's the end. Um, so on the left, on the top photo, you can see the screen sort of wedged off to the side. That's the only part of the electronics you have to be really delicate with. I killed my first smartwatch by ripping off the screen by accident. And once that cable's torn, there's not much you can do. Um, that's the inside. It's got a vibration motor, which you can see is with that round silver disc. Below that is the battery, otherwise known as the spicy pillow. Um, below those, stuck in place with double-sided tape, is a heart rate sensor, they claim. Uh, on the left is the back of the PCB. This is, <coughs> there's the special flex PCB that holds the heart rate sensor. 
on the board itself, it's got some interesting test points. Now, if you're not used to taking things apart, test points are um, they're little places where generally they will probe the device to figure out what it's doing. They use them during manufacturing for programming. They use it to debug them and things like that. So these are the kind of things you look at if you're going to reverse engineer something or hack on a device. You go and find them because generally they're the interesting signals. Um, this is just the PCB. You can see the component size. We'll get into that now. So hardware reverse engineering. This is my hobby. I enjoy taking things apart. And like I say, I enjoy reverse engineering. Basically, it's educated guesswork. Don't listen to All it is is you're taking a bunch of guesses. Occasionally, you'll guess right. Most of the time, you guess wrong. Doesn't matter. Next time around, you'll get better. If you want to get good at this, take lots of things apart. Um, you can, if you can't afford to take things apart or you don't have space or you've run out of space, uh, YouTube. Just put in teardown, put in anything like that, and you can watch other people take things apart that you would never be, get access to. Everything from missile guidance systems to Russian computers to bits of Soyuz capsule to Apollo guidance computers. And there's much more smarter people than I explaining in great detail how they work. The more you do this, the more you'll recognize things. And that's how reverse engineering works. It's pattern recognition. You see something and you go, ooh, I've seen that before. I know how that works. Or I have no idea what that thing is. You figure it out later. You store it in the back of your head. And six months time when you see it again, you now know. So identifying components on a PCB is relatively easy. Anything with three legs or less, it's not important. The reason I say that is you need more than three legs because you've got power, which is two, two legs. The third leg's not enough to get anything interesting in and out of the chip. So don't worry about three legs or less. Once you, to figure out what the parts do, just Google them, Bing them, duck, duck, go them. If you still can't find them, look on AliExpress or Taobao or Alibaba, just Taobao, you just use the Google Translate. All you're looking for is some vague idea of what the thing is. Once you know, you can move on and guess the other parts. For those of you who don't know, Baidu is a Chinese search engine. Again, Google Translate. You'll find things there that aren't anywhere else, and that's partially because China don't like the rest of the internet, so they have their own little private one. And Baidu is quite a nice way into that world. Like I say, Google Translate, and you'll be fine. So identifying components, this is the fun bit. That's the PCB. As you can see, I've highlighted all the various bits and pieces. Uh, these are all the three-legged components. So these are all the uninteresting things. Um, there's a SMT, SMD transistor, the red one. The orange one is also a transistor or a MOSFET technically. It doesn't matter. You can think of these things as switchy things. It, it really, it's not gonna matter for the greater, in the greater scheme of things. The last one is a voltage regulator. Basically, that powers things. Um, now we get on to the interesting bits. So yeah, we have the first one is the blue thing at the top. Um, that's a linear charge controller. It manages the battery. Now, the only reason I say this is gets interesting is because you're going to need to know this if you want to power the device, if you want to check battery levels and all this kind of thing. The yellow thing is a touch controller. This device is really wacky. It's only got one specific spot that you have to magically get your finger to align with to touch. There's no touch screen. There's none of that. There's a tiny little circle at the bottom of the screen and you have to carefully line your finger up. And when you touch it, that is a touch. The other option you have is hold your finger there for slightly longer. And that's the longer touch. Those are the only inputs on this device. And, um, I say finger, but it will also work anything else that triggers capacitive touch. So the amount of times that you've sneezed near the thing and it suddenly decided I'm clicking tap, touch thing five times and you on the wrong screen. The last one I'm guessing, I can't find any documentation about this. It's kind of hard when you only got four letters to guess what the thing is. But based on what this watch does, I'm guessing it's an accelerometer or inertial measurement unit or something vaguely like that. Basically, this watch counts steps, so it needs some way to count steps. I couldn't find anything else that looked like step counting things. So I'm guessing that's what it is. It also happens to correspond to other accelerometer chips. I'm pretty good. I'm pretty sure that's a good guess. 
then the most important part of this thing is that chip. This is a T-Link TLS TLSR8232. That is the heart of this thing. It's a system on chip. It handles all the Bluetooth and it basically controls everything. This is the other PCB, the heart rate sensor. So on this PCB, there's three things. Two green LEDs <coughs> and it's a resistor. And I guess the giveaway here is the tag, the messaging, the silk screen on the actual board. Note it says LT716 LED 0603. FPC means flexible PCB normally. No heart rate sensor, but maybe they're doing something magical. Maybe we've discovered that LEDs now can act as heart rate sensors. I mean, it's possible, you know, no doubt. <clears throat> but I'm pretty sure that explains why my desk has a heart rate of 70 beats per minute. Um, yeah, this thing has no heart rate sensor. It's completely fake and it's pretty common. A lot of these cheap ones have fake heart rate sensors. They, they look the same as my Huawei or a Samsung or an Apple iPhone. They all blink nice and fast. It looks like a proper sensor. It's not. It's just a bunch of LEDs and you'll quickly realize this. Put one on after climbing stairs and it says your heart rate is 68 beats per minute. Um, or it will say your O2 levels are 99% all the time, consistently. The best one is it's got at the bottom there, that is your blood pressure. Now, for those of you who don't know, you can't actually take blood pressure through heart rate sensor. Uh, there's guys have, there's a whole paper about why you can't, but basically it comes down to, that's just a guess. I have high, high blood pressure. So I know that when I put it on, the values are way out of whack. And that was the first hint that there's something questionable about this device, but hey, it's 150 Rand watch. What are you? expect. On to the test points. These are all the interesting things. So normally when you're hacking a, a router or something big with that runs Android or Linux or something like that on, then you're looking for the serial ports. On this device, serial means nothing. Those points are just happen to be wired into the serial pins of the chip, but you can't actually do anything with them. I did check. There's nothing coming out of them. The BT one is just a link to the antenna. I'm guessing that's for some sort of testing. The VBUS one that I've put their bus voltage, that's actually the USB charge positive I figured out a while back. The interesting point points on the other side, there's the T12, T15, that's just the, the single touch point. Um, there's a 3.3 volt, that's just a voltage. There's a DAT pin, which I have no idea what it does. I can't make it do anything. And then there's SWS, which it turns out is a debug interface. So this is the actual chip. This is sort of a block diagram of how it works. And um, there's a couple of versions of this particular one. Uh, T-Link is kind of interesting. It turns out that the chips are in all kinds of devices. I happened to take a gamepad a couple of days ago apart and in there is a chip made by a totally different company. And it turns out they licensed their technology from T-Link. Um, the chip has 16K of RAM, 512K of flash this particular one in the uh, watch runs at 24 megahertz it's got a proprietary debug protocol because of course and it's instruction set they claim is proprietary it's a tc32 <clears throat> turns out it's essentially a clone of a 16-bit arm nine thumb instruction set with a few tweaks because you can't just clone things automatically you've got to add something um, so the SY debug interface, this is what got me interested in this particular watch. Um, yes, I do occasionally buy cheap electronics and take them apart. So it's a proprietary interface. Um, there is a program available. It's only 400 Rand. I am very, very tempted to buy it. The problem is the shipping to South Africa is over 750 Rand. Um, so it, it gets very expensive for, you know, a toy or potentially a B-Sides talk. If I do get this into DEF CON, maybe I'll buy one. Who knows? There is an open source SYI debugger. There's a Russian guy called Victor who on GitHub has released a open source programmer. He's got a whole lot of details on it. It's not exactly for this particular chip, but people have said it works. And then there's another guy, well, another person, Rafael, who wrote a bunch of scripts that talks to that program and makes your life easier. So this is more or less what you have to do. You take your 
Bluepill board, which is a STM32 dev board. You load his fancy software onto that. You wire a couple of wires onto the board. Uh, you run the Python script and everything talks. So there I'm busy wiring it all up. Clean workbench. And you run it and then it crashes. Now at this point, I'd already submitted to B-Science, so I started panicking. Um, and yeah, so it turns out it doesn't work. The reason it doesn't work is there's no reset pin. For those of you who don't know what a reset pin does, it's the same as on your desktop machine. If you hold down reset, your computer is on, but not on. What reset does is holds the CPU in a state where it's ready with all the power and everything else, but it's not executing any instructions. Then the minute you let go of the reset button, the computer suddenly bursts into life and the CPU starts executing the instructions. When you want to try and program a microcontroller like this one, you need the same thing. You need to put it in this powered on state where it's sitting idle. And then as soon as it powers up, you hammer the SWS pin in this case, and you say, quick, 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 stop what you're doing and do what I want you to do. Without the reset pin, you have to do this other ways. You have to either toggle the power, which is a bit sketchy because things stay on but aren't on and all this kind of stuff, or you have to find some other way to glitch it into running this thing. I tried this quite a bit. I couldn't get it right. The other thing is the SWS pins also used to control the heart monitor LEDs. So you have to disconnect the heart monitor board. There's still a whole lot of components. I, since writing these slides, I've discovered that there's a trace you can cut and you can tack a wire on, and it seems to be a little bit better. But basically, the combination seems to mean I can't reliably pro program this particular watch, which kind of sucks. But then, when these kind of things happen, you take a little bit of a detour. So uh, let's talk about some Vikings. For those of you who don't know, Bluetooth is named after a Viking. Um, and in this case, it's called BLE or Bluetooth Low Energy. Uh, on this particular watch, Bluetooth is sketchy at best. It often just won't show up. It won't connect. It will tell you it's connected but not do anything. If you flick through the screens really fast and like I say, sneeze on the watch so it taps the button, it will connect for a little while. The official app solves this by caching um, and queuing. That's all they do, they just cache everything. So half the time the values you're looking at in the app don't actually match the watch. And often when it finally connects, it suddenly just hammers the poor watch with a whole lot of commands that you clicked. So if you got a bunch of notifications and your watch hasn't gone off and then all of a sudden it you know, rings for the last 10 minutes while it's key, all the notification notifications catch up. So when you want to explore Bluetooth low energy services, there's a great app for Android. I believe it's available for iPhone called NRF Connect. If you haven't used this app, it's awesome. It's made by Nordic. It's actually for the Nordic chips, but you can run it on, it will connect to any Bluetooth app, yay standards. So this, what's here is the various Bluetooth services provided by the watch. Now there are standards within BLE, so device information and battery service are normally uh, consistent across the various devices, and the other ones are just added on from manufacturer to manufacturer. Um, so what I'm gonna do is we'll quickly look at the battery service one. It's pretty easy, you expand the little thing in the app and you say download, and then it gives you the battery level. So you'll see on there, it says 100%. At that time, this battery was fully charged. Um, but you can also do it using GAT tool. Um, so basically, the, what I've got on the screen here is a bunch of Linux commands. Unfortunately, there's no GAT tool for Windows. Those of you on Mac OS, there is for Mac OS. Mac OS, Macs are special, and Bluetooth on them is extra special because uh, Apple, uh, Apple are privacy advocates which means that you don't get MAC addresses, you get funny UUID things, and it just makes everything miserable, but it's okay, I can't afford new Macs, so we'll stick to Linux. If you run GAT tool, it will connect to the watch, it'll pull down the um, battery value. As you can see there, all that information is the same as in the app, it's just not as pretty. You can do the same for the device information screen, you can connect to it via the app, you can say, give me your information, you'll see there, there's the, version firmware revision number. And if you do it through the GAT tool, you'll get a 
string of hex values, you convert those to ASCII and you'll see there's V0375. So it's very nice, but kind of boring. So there's, now we get to the interesting bits. So software reverse engineering, I don't know how many of you guys have done this kind of thing. Um, this is a lot of fun. You get your, your Android software. So in my case, I just Googled the official app called FitPro, grabbed the first APK I found, where you find it, what which one it is, doesn't matter too much. You just need a newish one. Um, and then you install this program. For those of you who don't know, it's a Java, D, a APK decompiler. Um, so all I have to do is take my Android app, dump it into this, and I get Java code out. It's one of the things that makes decompiling or messing with Android apps a lot of fun and really, really easy. Uh, you can do similar things on .NET and that, but all the the interpret, well, not interpret, the these modern languages like this with a bytecode that use bytecode, this works quite well with. The actual JADX uh, tool has come a long way since the last time I used it. You can click around and find all the stuff and do find using and all the things you used to in your common IDE all in their one Java app. You do need lots of memory though. This particular APK is about 100 megs, depending on which version you got. And when you see all the code in there, you suddenly realize why. The, the app itself talks to pretty much every social media known to man, including all the Chinese ones. They've got strange code to talk to both AWS S3 along with, I think it's the Baidu one, but a similar object storage thing in there. There's a whole lot of other code in there. And it's Java, it's, you know. So we'll we'll start off simple. This is the Android app. You'll note I've highlighted the find function. What this does is if you tap it, your watch will vibrate so that you can find it. And in 10 minutes time when the message actually gets through. Um, so what you do is you go into JADX and you find where this happens in the code. This is where, like I say, you if you've done Java app development at any point, this becomes easy to do, figure out what's going on. If you haven't, go buy yet another Udemy course and spend five minutes learning something about uh, about Android apps. So this is on the fragment, which is part of the screen that shows up. You'll see there's a line that I've highlighted there, which is command pool write. Like I say, everything's a queue. And it's this get send find me value. And Chinese there, I think, says find phone or find device or something like that. So what you do is you go dig through that. So the top is the get set find me value. That then passes through to switch protocol. Switch protocol then builds up this string of, on the string, array of bytes. So like I say, it's relatively easy to figure out what's going on. You can then work backwards from there and you can say, well, this is the byte string that's been sent to my device. Um, the interesting bit there, that negative 51 just means you take it and subtract it from 255, 256, one of the two, and you'll get a value out. Java's weird. And I think it might just be the decompiling, but I noticed this is done all over in this particular app. Um, once you've done that, you now need to figure out how it writes it. So again, you look at this, you say, well, okay, we'll go look at what makes command pool write work. All it does is it adds a write command to a command pool. Um, and looking at that, uh, the sort of gut reaction is, well, okay, so it's a generic add command, command method. So what is write char? So you go and look up what write char is, and write char is a characteristic. What that means in the BLE world is that's basically the endpoint that you're going to write your stuff to. It's normally along the UUID. When you're writing over Bluetooth, you need to translate the UUID to an actual handle, which is a hex value. So you go dig through, you get your UUID, and you put all this together. So now what I have is I have the string of bytes that needs to do something. And along with that, I have where to send it. So <laughs> then we'll put something together quick. This is just some quick code to do all the various manipulations of the bytes because I'm lazy. And then it just prints it out as a string. 
if you're curious, all this code is available on GitHub. So at the bottom there, there's a bunch of strings. There's a bunch of bytes. You push those bytes through. So first thing you need to do is find a device on Linux HCI tool, LE scan will do it. That will find the device. You then take that. You have to find the handle for that particular UUID. So you can run this char description that brings up all the UUIDs and then through there you wait through until you find the handle. Like I say, you can also just use NRF Connect to find it. Way easier, but yeah, we need we needed more slides. So finally, you put it all together and you get a command line like this. And then, well, then you run it. And this is what happens. Ooh. It works. Now, this took me about two months, three months to get to this point. I know and this, this talk is, there's a lot of dead ends that aren't showing up. This is not, you know, five minutes of messing around. But cool, we're getting somewhere. Okay, so notifications. Now, I'm not going to walk you through how notifications work. I have put up some code that will generate valid notification strings. There's also a blog post that explains all of the stuff in much more detail. But basically, if you go there, you can get the code. Um, so what that does will come back with a long string of bytes. You pass these bytes because of the way Bluetooth low energy works in this particular case, it can only be 20 bytes long. So you have to split it into two writes and you send them. And then this will happen eventually. Now, trust me, I don't have a serial on my uh, phone. This device wasn't connected to my phone. So you can send messages from anyone, any number to this device. The fun thing is it supports WhatsApp and SMS, QQ, WeChat, Facebook, LinkedIn, Skype, and a whole lot of other protocols that will show up. So you can pretend to be anyone and send a, your watch a notification. Anyone knows this anything odd? Hmm? Now? Yes. Um, no authentication, no keys, didn't even have to pair with the device. Yeah, so security was clearly an afterthought when they built this thing. The system on chip does support AES encryption, but nah, they couldn't be bothered. The SDK has examples of only exposing certain things once you paired with the device. Yeah, that wasn't done either. Um, the only actual security they implemented was that the watch will only connect with one other device. But the Bluetooth connection is so terrible that it will probably lose its connection just while you're walking around. So if you happen to walk near someone else, assuming you're really lucky and your device connects to it, you can just send them notifications. If it is actually a pretty good strong connection, all you have to do is put a human body between the watch and the device. So if they have it paired with a cell phone, um, the Bluetooth is terrible enough that it won't go through a person. So if you are one of those people who wear a watch on your left hand, but put your cell phone in your right pocket, your cell phone and your watch will never communicate while you're just standing around. You have to bring them together in some way. Um, it even gets better than that. There was a project I can't pronounce. I think it's Swine Tooth. We'll just go with that. They did a research project where they looked at Bluetooth across a whole lot of devices. And it turns out that T-Link is in that list. So these are the two CVEs that are listed. I do like the fact that, you know, or possibly control the device's function by establishing an encryption connection with zero. I think the LTK is a long-term key. Um, the other one is a buffer overflow attack. Uh, after reading these, I suddenly realized why my watch crashes a lot when I was poking at it with random values. And when I mean crash, I mean lock up dead. The only way to get this and revive it was rip the battery off and put it back in. And this is probably why. The SDKs that have these things is all of them, and they did release a patch to the SDK, but the patch is an additional file. It's not a new version of the SDK. So you download the SDK and then you have to apply their patch. 
because it's separate. I'm pretty sure no one ever applies that patch. So I'm pretty sure that all of these things have similar vulnerabilities. I mean, this is fine, right? This is fine. Okay, so now we'll get on to another interesting thing. The watch supports OTA upgrades. For those of you who don't know, that's over the air. So um, let's go look at that. So back into the Android code, go poke around, and I found this line. Builder.add header authorization. Those of you who do anything with the web, hopefully will recognize that. You see constant.token? Could they have? Oh, yes, they did. There is the bearer token in the code. Oh, and it doesn't expire either. So um, you can take the bearer token and you can query their API. So let's, there's the how the builds the API string. I've got all those values. So let's plug them all in and run it. And you get nothing back. Now, my friend Ross sitting in front here, he had a poke at this API when I showed him this much, much later. I should have shown him earlier. He poked at the API and he actually managed to get some binary images off of it. I So there's work still to be done. But like I said, it's there. Um, but we'll go a little bit further. How does OTA upgrade work? There's a start OTA. Let's go look at that. So start OTA sends something to an endpoint. Hmm, okay. Let's go look. Cool. And there's a parser. So the parser takes your binary image, breaks it up into a whole lot of blocks, tax a CRC on the end, tax an index on the front, and that's it. The send OTA prepare command, no, that just sends a few bytes to an endpoint. There's other commands. So there's start OTA, there's a send end OTA, which includes the checksum, and uh, that's about it. So, okay, let's do the same as last time. Let's go look at our OTA characteristic. So we'll dig through that, we'll get a UUID, We've got the commands now. We know that OTA prepare and we know what the start command is and we know there's an end with the checksum. So let's try it. What could go wrong? Yeah, so uh, if you take GAT tool again, because I feel like it, do all the backwards working so you can get a handle for the particular characteristic. And we're going to write the start OTA command to it and see what happens. The device suddenly changes name. It also goes black. So at this point, the device is called T-Link Remote, which isn't LT716 anymore. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, it turns out you can't get out of OTA mode once you're in it. Didn't know that. So this one got added to the pile of bricked watches. And again, no authentication, no keys. Didn't even have to pair and it gets worse. No validation checks. That means that in a room like this, and this is why there's no live demo, if I get the MAC address wrong, I can brick a watch just from standing here. Lovely, isn't it? Okay, well, that's fine. So let's talk about the firmware. Again, T-Link offer a free SDK very kindly. There's a whole lot of questionable GPL violations in this, but we won't go into those. They also have an ID based on Eclipse. All of this only runs on Windows. There is a free TC32 compiler based off of GCC, but they've never released the code, but there's a compiler at least. And Raphael has packaged it all together into a Docker image if you don't run Windows. And uh, to be honest, the Docker image is much nicer than trying to fight with Eclipse. So we know enough about the device and the hardware to write something. It would be easy to toggle the GPIO, for example, and blink an LED. I could start guessing the SPI bus commands to write to the LCD. Problem is that there's no reliable way to upload the firmware to the device. So options of experimentation become very, very limited. So we know we can upload something via OTA update. Why not try uploading an OTA enabled firmware image? And we can use one of the example apps. And if it works, then we have a starting point. So let's do this. So we'll build this 5136 remote BLE, which is in their SDK. The reason I'm choosing this particular one is because it's got, according to the code, it's got over the air updates enabled. Um, and I can switch off all of the stuff. It's for building a BLE remote control, but you can just turn off all the matrix keyboard stuff and things like that. 
So cool, I'll make a small change to the code just so that I know my code's loaded. So we'll just change what the name of the device is to my name and we'll build it. Gives us a bin farm. Um, then what I did was I took the parsing code out of the Android app, stuck it into a Java app, put all the missing bits and pieces around that, and then made it so that it would spit out GAT tool command lines. Literally just print to console, copy, paste, stick in SH file. Lazy. So here we have, we go and get the handle again for OTA updates. We have our script. I've cut it in half because it's 400 and something lines. But this should do an update, right? So we'll run the script and then, yeah, the device vanished. So at this point, I'm very, very sure I've bricked the device. Again, no keys, no firmware checks, no validation, not even proper checksums. Oh, no signed firmware updates either. This is all just poking random values at the device. Um, so at this point, I kind of give up. Um, I have spent three months poking at a device and I have found all kinds of scary things and I have a bunch of them dead. So I can't program it anymore over Bluetooth. I don't have a working SWS debugger and I have three working watches left. Um, so obviously I'm not going to constantly try over the air updates. But there will be more to come. Like I say, sharing this project with Ross, I found out I got some binary images. What this means is that in theory, I can decompile them and poke at those. Um, it's not, obviously it's a weird, no one's heard of proprietary architecture. So Ghidra doesn't support it, but someone has hacked some support in on Ghidra and it does kind of work. So you can at least get disassemblies. You won't get actual code. That part hasn't been finished yet, which means that in theory, I could take the firmware apart and poke at it. The other nice thing is that means that I might be able to patch the firmware. The way the OTA update works, you pass it an index of the bytes that you want to over, that you uploading, but it also means that you can upload a patch because you can say only update bytes. These few bytes say bytes 20 to 40 and leave the rest alone which means that if I have a working, if I have a firmware image, I can then patch the binary and put my own features into it, which means that I could make a watch that does something magical when I send it a particular command, or maybe a watch that when it sees another watch, it sends its firmware across to that watch, which means that that watch could then send its firmware to another watch, which means that at some point someone's gonna come and say, hey, listen, why did you go and brick 20 watches? Um, like I say, there are documents for the SWS protocol. Um, they were leaked at some point. If you go and search in Google, you will find you can find them. There are open source projects that do talk it. So I could try and fix whatever's broken with that. And or I could just go give in, spend the money, buy the official programmer. And that's my talk. For those of you wondering or want more information and all the things that didn't make it into this talk. There, that's my website. It's got a blog article that I wrote while doing all this. I'm terribly sorry. It's 6,000 and something words. It's really long, but maybe you'll find something interesting. It's also got links to all the tools and all the code. It's also got all of the other things that I found along the way that might be interesting. Also people, information, Bluetooth guides on reverse engineering Bluetooth. If you are interested in that kind of thing, Autofruit has a whole series of blog posts all about reverse engineering Bluetooth. They're really well written. They're really dumbed down. They're perfect for people like me. And yeah, at some point in the future, I will, I promise, revive my dead collection of watches. I spent 600 Rand on them. I need to bring them, make them do at least something. And that's my talk. If anyone's got any questions, please. So it's lunchtime. So what I would suggest is finding him downstairs rather, because we have to be back here at one. Oh, yes. Yes. No, no. I'm not getting between hackers and food. Please go find your lunch. <laughs>